We're up against some very serious foes that are determined to get these coal plants done quickly before it gets tougher and tougher. They have a $35 million budget. We are just a grassroots group of concerned citizens who would like to continue breathing this beautiful, fresh, sunny air that we get. And they have a tremendous budget called the Coalition for uh, Balanced Energy, as I think is the term that they use for it. They have an extremely large budget. They're fighting in Kansas. They're fighting everywhere. Can you pan over, Tony? I'm sorry, you, you don't want us to talk to these guys? Well, uh, these guys are, are, are hired to do this job. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a communications director for a West region. So I'd much rather, if we're going to talk about issues and we're going to be labeled as an organization, that we have someone from the organization speak. OK, why don't you stand in front of Kevin then? OK. So tell us what are you, you guys are about. What is clean coal? Well, first of all, the organization's called Americans for Balanced Energy Choices. It's a nonprofit organization funded by uh, the coal-fueled electricity industry. By that, I mean organizations that mine coal, organizations that transport coal, and organizations that use coal to, to produce electricity. And what is clean coal? Well, clean coal, I think you're referring to the technology that is used to allow coal to burn cleaner. Uh, coal technology, uh, anything related to scrubbers. Uh, we obviously are talking about the development and employment of technology that allows carbon to be captured and sequestered. Uh, there are any number of different technologies out there that allow coal to burn cleaner, uh, up to 70% cleaner than it did more than 30 years ago. So you mean cleaner coal? Absolutely. There's no energy source that's absolutely and perfectly clean. By all accounts, the, uh, the coal industry and coal interests have spent upwards of 30 or 40 million dollars in the past year on propaganda uh, to try to promote the concept of clean coal. And the reason for that is very simple. Coal is the biggest source of global warming pollution in this country. It is the biggest source of dangerous uh, health-related air pollution in this country. The CNN YouTube Republican debate. And we have seen massive propaganda during the uh, recent presidential election where the coal industry was underwriting uh, at least one of the debates. Americans for balanced energy choice. They showed up at the campaign rallies of both the major parties uh, with this incessant mantra, uh, clean coal, clean coal, clean coal, as if uh, if you said it often enough, it would become reality. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. As a candidate and as president, Barack Obama has endorsed clean coal. My budget also invests $15 billion each year for 10 years to develop clean energy, including wind power and solar power, and geothermal energy, and clean coal technology. So clean coal is, is sort of like uh, healthy cigarettes or limited nuclear war or uh, fat-free donuts. It's one of the great oxymorons of our time. It is not a thing. It is, an, a, it is an advertising slogan. And it's being pushed on us right now to, in order to uh, make us feel better about burning coal and to convince us that we need to burn coal in order to keep our plasma screens lit up and our internet connections going and all of this wonderful modern life that we have, that we can do this in a pain-free way and that we don't have to change. It's a uh, kind of a diet pill for our energy problems. You load 16 tons of Imagine if a 250-year supply of energy were right here at home. Now, thanks to emissions-reducing technology from GE Energy, harnessing the power of coal is looking more beautiful every day.
So all this money that's going to the coal industry right now is all about only one thing, and that is making coal a viable fuel in a world that takes global warming seriously. Uh, this isn't a great bike for speed bumps, honestly. If anyone knows what real clean coal technology might look like, it would be Dr. Julio Friedman of the government's Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. The bike's good for a lot of things, but bumps aren't one of them. Every year, people on the planet put 32 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's about 70 times the mass of all the people on Earth. Every year, we put that in the atmosphere. Half of that goes into the ocean and makes it acidic. The ecosystem of the planet is in dire jeopardy. At the rate of ocean acidification, there's a very real chance that we're going to crash the bottom of the food chain in less than 30 years. And then that's just game over. There's serious risk for all the coral reefs in the world, which hold half the species in the ocean. And the biggest single emission source is coal-fired power plants. Well, Julio Friedman is a, a really brilliant scientist and one of the few people out there who really understands the real scope and scale of the challenge that we face, both on global warming and on retrofitting our energy system uh, to, to deal with this. You might ask, actually, why is a you know, nuclear weapons laboratory engaged in carbon management? Um, the reason why is basically it's an issue of national security, actually. We have to get carbon dioxide emissions uh, down. It's a global challenge, and it's one that's worthy of a national laboratory. So uh, as, as an example of the contribution of coal to our society, the camera that's shooting this is made out entirely out of rocks. It's, the metal was slagged. The plastic was fabricated from petroleum. I mean, the whole thing came from rocks, and it was built in a plant that was run with coal power. The heat that went into making this camera was almost entirely coal power. And that's, you know, what our world is built out of on some, you know, freakish way. That's sort of how it all comes together. Um, there's only a handful of things that we can do to reduce emissions into the atmosphere. We have energy efficiency and conservation. We can reduce our output. We can go after non-carbon emitting sources. We can have renewables and nuclear and geothermal and whatever. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can keep using fossil fuels and, you know, deal with the waste. We can take care of that CO2 and put it deep underground where it's out of the atmosphere. Friedman is one of the world's leading authorities in the technology called carbon capture and sequestration, sometimes known as CCS. Here we see uh, CO2 flowing into a fracture that's previously filled with water. We see very complex geometry that occurs. concentrate the CO2 to high purity, and you stuff it into deep geological formations. Um, the Earth's crust is well configured to do this. There are multiple trapping mechanisms that keep the CO2 deep underground, and we have technology to do this. We've been injecting CO2 in the Earth's crust for 40 years and for, for enhanced oil recovery. We've been doing it a couple of places for sequestration for a decade. Uh, let me uh, say hello and welcome you all to the second session this afternoon. This is the seventh annual National Energy Technology Lab Carbon Capture and Sequestration Conference. It's interesting for a couple of reasons. There's actually so much going on that you can't keep track of anything anymore. It, it rep represents an increasing maturity of this technology and this interest. National Energy Technology Laboratory now. Where do you fit in? I have good days and bad days. Sometimes I wake up and I go, we're going to get there. We're going to solve the climate crisis. We're going to round the corner. And then there's other days I wake up and I go, we're never going to make it. It's just impossible. We're all doomed. And with respect to sequestration, I'm pretty optimistic because there's actually no technical barriers at all. There's no miracles required. Um, instead, it actually relies on people being sensible and people being reasonable. And that's why I go up and down, because it's not clear that people are going to be sensible and reasonable about this. Coal is a very dirty business. You've seen the mountaintop removal. Um, there are a lot of other pollutants that get emitted. Uh, now, it is certainly true that some of the advanced 
uh, carbon capture and storage technologies would get most of those pollutants. The question is, what's the relative price and practicality? Joe Rome was Assistant Secretary of Energy in the Clinton administration and is now one of the toughest and smartest commentators on America's energy issues. Since coal with carbon capture and storage isn't commercial, no one can tell you what the price will be. The, the analysis that I've seen of what the price would be is quite expensive. So until there is a high price for carbon dioxide, uh, no one is going to be interested in it at all from a commercial perspective. So where are we at with carbon capture and sequestration? We've passed the laugh test. We know that the technology could work. We just haven't quite done it yet. We haven't built the first integrated plant and demonstrated that it can be done. And I just eagerly await the day. We still don't know what the hell to do with nuclear waste. And how long has that industry been around for? I mean, I think that's an excellent, actually an excellent analogy. I think people are very unaware. Underneath is a shiny idea of clean coal is a proposal to essentially bury carbon dioxide underneath the ground all over North America. And I think if people were aware of the scale at which this was being proposed, there would be a whole lot more concern than there is right now. In other words, for carbon capture and storage to work, we're going to have to figure out a way to capture the CO2 that's coming out of the stack, compress it, bury it underground, and do this on every plant in the world. It's an enormous project, an enormous engineering project. I like to think of it as something on the scale of putting a, a, a manned mission on Mars, just in the amount of money and just sheer engineering willpower that it will take. And a, a big problem is that a lot of places like this don't have the right geology to do this. So in order to bury the CO2, they're going to have to pump it sometimes hundreds of miles to somewhere that's more suitable. There would be pipelines across the country. We'd have large compressing stations. We'd have CO2 farms in part of the world where there was large resource to sequester, maybe in Montana and Illinois and Wyoming and Texas. And we would be injecting CO2 for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. But we can think about something which is twice as big as the oil economy because we've already built an oil economy. We've got the technology to do that. We know what it costs. We need to do these things. In the same way that we spent the money to build the oil and gas infrastructure, we can spend the money to build the CO2 infrastructure. We just have to decide that the climate problem is that urgent. One of the biggest problems uh, is that we don't have a very good handle on how you measure and verify that CO2 is underground and is going to stay underground. Suppose Putin's Russia said that they were capturing carbon dioxide and burying it underground, and would someone pay them a billion dollars a year for that? Well, you would say no, not unless we could send in some independent team of verifiers like the UN weapons inspectors. That sort of a system has to be set up or no one's gonna trust anybody. Our argument is stop increasing the burning of coal now, period. There is no excuse to continue, to continue growing our dependence on coal. We need to move away from it. With CCS, try and make it happen. Try and make it happen in a way that's totally safe and economically viable without depending on a massive payout from taxpayers' money. And let's see what you come up with. If it's a success, it could be a bonanza for the coal industry because we would actually have to use more coal to power the machinery to suck the junk out of the coal. It's one of the reasons they're trying to get massive federal subsidies to underwrite the research and development of this technology. While coal state legislators held up President Obama's stimulus package to extract funding for clean coal, small local entrepreneurs were already showing there was money to be made and carbon to be saved by pursuing alternative energy options, sometimes in unexpected places. <laughs> 